It's just thinking, huh, I'm hearing all this. Is this something I should eat? Is this something I should fuck? Is this something I should kill? That's all I want to know. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast here with my co-host, the multi-family mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I am excited today. We're going to be learning an important topic for multifamily. So everyone, put off whatever you're doing, take out a pen and paper, and I promise the next 45 minutes, you will get a ton of value, guaranteed. Hey, here's a little teaser liquidity is is going to rule when these deals start coming up so you're going to need the money and you're going to need to know how to get the money and that's what today is all about mm -hmm. a very special guest today's guest is Oren Clef. Oren is one of the world's leading experts on sales raising capital and negotiation his first book pitch anything is required reading throughout silicon valley wall street and the fortune 500 with more than 1 million copies in print worldwide so without further ado Oren welcome to the show Hey, I appreciate that. That was a warm welcome. I don't always get that. Hey, we, we, we do what we can. We try to make it happen. We're, we're very excited to have you today. So tell us, you know, I, I read your book, you know, you know, many years ago. Tell us how you became the pitch master. I know a little bit about your story, but I, I want to hear it live. Yeah, I mean, uh, how do you, you know, if you have watched a black belt kung fu movie ever, how do you become a master in any, anything? Pain misery, they kill your whole family, you are sent into the desert for years with no food, and, and you find ways to survive, and you come back to civilization a master. So I don't think my journey was that different. <laughs> uh, so I, I was put in very tough deals by my partner. We worked with Goldman Sachs, and you know at that time, Bear Stearns, and uh, you know, some of the largest banks is a very small company. Um, we did sort of 40 to $50 million syndications, maybe sometimes touching, breaking through into the 60, $70 million, um, you know, airspace and sort of doing nothing less than 25, $30 million and getting thrown into that from a situation of my partner would organize the debt and he would say to me, you get the equity, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so at that time, you know, maybe 70% a 70, 30 debt, uh, debt to equity ratio. So I'd have to go find six, $7 million, but he would give me 35 days to do it in the way that he would lock up the debt. Uh, you know, he would get the excellent pricing on the debt by making an equity commitment that was very short. Right. And so you get better price in the debt, less of a loan commitment, um, mm -hmm. better terms, more, uh, interest only, more IO, uh, but the the issue is we had to go get the equity very quickly. And so he'd say, hey, I need $7 million in 35 days. And just are you watching Lego Masters? And your time begins now. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I'd, I'd have to put together a, a pitch deck and a pitch and a way to go find that equity from a dead stop. And that's the world that I was put into. And that's where, you know, whether you call it mastery or expertise or familiarity, whatever you want to call it, is where I learned a lot of these skills. Oren, what did you like about it? Pain, misery, suffering. You know, I just, I just gravitate to that stuff. Uh, I think it was very high stakes. You know exactly where you are. You are, um, it's exciting. Uh, and my partner was, was, you know, very, uh, you know, it looks like he was, he was on the path to become a billionaire and, uh, I was compensated really well. So if he becomes a billionaire, I become a hundred millionaire. And that was the path we were on sort of in 2006 and 2008, you know, he made some different decisions to, he's like, why do I need a billion dollars? <laughs> right. Uh, but, but anyway, I, the compensation was terrific. It was very excited. We flew around in a jet. Um, you know, we'd land the jet and people go, who are you? And I, you know, I got to say, I'm nobody. But, uh, <laughs> so it's a very exciting world. So other than the pain, the misery and sucking at it, what did you hate about it? Gina, hit that one again and cut out. Oh, other than the pain, the misery and sucking at it, what did you hate about it? Yeah. I mean, it was 
the the thing I didn't like about it is the lifestyle that I did it in used up a lot of the money that I was making. So if you sort of the metaphor of, hey, I'm going broke on $3 million a year, right? Mm -hmm. Flew around in a $30 million aircraft. All our meetings were at the Beverly Hills Hotel in the villas. I'll tell you a great story. I went to a meeting very early on in the career uh, with my partner. And um, at that point, I had a couple cars, but one of my, I had a pickup truck because I uh, raced motorcycles. So it was my, and it was sort of the, when you live in the Hollywood Hills, there's parking is very scarce. So it was like the easiest thing I could get to in my driveway. And my other cars were sports cars. So I take my pickup truck, a Ford F-150 flare side crew cab, and I drive down to the Beverly Hills Hotel and I pull in to the valet and they go, as you know, can I valet your car? And I know I'm, I'm picking some guys up. So I go to pick up my partner and uh, one of the, partners that uh, he was doing a deal with and he gets in and he goes Oren what are you doing I said well I'm just you asked pick up I'm here on time you know we'll go taking you to the next meeting he goes never pick me up in a pickup truck ever again <laughs> that's blue collar work ethic man come on here's here's a hundred and five thousand dollars go buy yourself an m5 so Getting handed $105,000 to go buy an M5 when you sort of have $4,000 in your bank account is a very uh, surreal experience, right? And so I went and bought the M5. And then I didn't have anywhere to park it. I didn't have any other need for it. And I parked mm -hmm. it at the gym at Equinox in Beverly Hills for like three years until I sold it and drove it like two times. But uh, so I didn't like to answer your question, which I don't think I've done. I didn't, I, I didn't uh, like sort of the world that that put me into it was it was hard to be humble and low-key and do deals at that level with this cohort of 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 people uh and so now i think i could do it better this was many years ago but but um i got the hungry part but it was a little hard to be humble so value-based decision-making, Mr. Stenziano. It's, it's all about when you start out in the beginning, you know, you're looking around and you get these shiny objects. Oren, before we jump into the book, because I got a lot of questions about the book, how has raising capital changed from back then till now? Have there been a lot of changes in raising capital in doing deals in your estimation? So that's a yes and no question. I mean, fundamentally, the mechanics of raising capital, you know, reg, you've got, you know, Reg D syndications are more, common mm -hmm. um you've got these sort of crowdfunding efforts and doing well i'm not sure how you guys raise capital there's a much higher likelihood here's how i'd focus it today cap you can raise capital uh without having to physically meet people mm -hmm. much more it's much more common i would say most of the deals we in, we're in we don't meet physically the investors or sometimes even our clients maybe once but there aren't so we're going to fly to chicago and do a meeting which is terrific it's almost rare for us to meet the investors that are coming into our deals. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that's changed, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I say that because capital raising is really about human fundamentals. Yep. There's no slide deck, spreadsheet, regression, technical analysis, pricing model, competitive set, that is so compelling, somebody's gonna give you their capital without you having to run the mechanics of real capital raising the way it was done in 1850 and 1910 and you know 1955 and 1988 and 2001 and 2008 and 2015 and today. So it's a very humanistic, human-driven uh, um, kind of business and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the words, hey, it's driven by relationship because sometimes we meet someone, we don't have a relationship, you know, we create it, but it is driven by the mechanics of wanting and trusting and certainty and supply and demand. And in those ways, it hasn't changed at all. So I, I just want to be clear because you didn't come right out and say it, but I, I, what I sort of heard was that it, it may be more investors today at smaller ticket amounts. Is that fair or not fair? Well, I, I mean, I think the markets, it, you can get more investors in smaller tickets amounts. I mean, not to mention, you know, any, any names of people, but Cardone, you know, he's apparently took 3,200 tickets at, I did the math at twenty-five dollars to $50,000 each. Now things are unwinding. I would not want to be managing 3,200 investors. I mean, Great that point. I mean, that I meant when we had a downturn in 2008, 
uh, we had a syndication with 120 investors in it uh, and the assets were doing okay, but we needed to reprice the debt as everyone was. You go to the debt and you say, hey, we want to reprice the debt and do a little bit of a workout. And they go, great, no problem. Happy to do it with you, right? But we can't do it while you're paying equi uh, you know, these, the equity a 6 or 8% coupon. So I had to go back to 120 equity guys and say, hey, we'd like to reduce distributions to something lower so we can work with the debt. And they all go, no, why would we do that? And so now that was 120 and eventually you know, it took me like six months to get everybody to understand the debt is not going to become junior to the equity, right? They want to stay in the senior position and they're mm -hmm. not going to negotiate while we're making uh, distributions. If, if that, I, you know, I don't know if your audience is at that level. No, no, no. I'm sure that it's, yeah. I'm sure that's very clear to, is what you're okay. saying. Okay. Yeah. Good. I, you know, so sometimes it's, uh, we, we, we got, we got some super things. smart folks on this show. So you're in the right spot here. Oh, you like smart folks. They won't <laughs> like me. Uh, but, but now, you know, that guy has to go back that's 120, go back to 3,200 investors and say, we're, you're not going to clip the coupon that I promised you. And, and a guy who invests $25,000 is probably really, that's, that's a lot of his capital. Yeah really looking today for that coupon and now you're going back to them and say hey we're going to reset that coupon to zero or lock it in at zero so we can go renegotiate the debt and i mean that is catastrophic so, so the trust factor gets bashed right there yeah. yeah 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 so that's a lot of work you know just to just the reporting to talk to so yes you can get a lot of small tickets but i think you have to be cautious about what you're syndicating into you know ground lease great um, a fully loaded Southern Florida multifamily new construction, you know, with a 90% occupancy and a seven year workout plan and selling it at a, you know, lower cap rate than the entry cap rate. I mean, that's, um, I think that's a tough deal to take a large number of smaller syndicated investors unsophisticated into. So yes, you can raise, look, I would summarize it like this. You know, my superpowers if that is, is raising capital. The problem is when you know how to raise capital, you can raise money for things that sometimes shouldn't get money. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and, and so that for people who are struggling to raise capital, you know, I want them to wake up to the notion that uh, there's a skill set. And, and I, we could talk a little bit about why people are bad at it, uh, you know, in a minute. Um, but there's a skill set you can become so good at that you can plug into capital all the time. Mm -hmm. right? and, and it's not plugging into capital is the hard part. It's deploying the capital and making sure, you know, you send it out that it comes back with friends because sometimes uh, that, that, you know, doesn't happen. And so, you know, as my partner would say, sometimes, you know, the best deals that I'll do are ones where I just get my money back because there's nothing more miserable. <laughs> uh, so, so taking capital is step one you know, making sure the asset works out is step two. And those things are inextricably connected to each other. They are two sides of the same pancake. Every mm -hmm. pancake has two sides, no matter how thin. And so people, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in real estate that I meet, the, the capital raising is the everything. And the assumption is that the asset will work out. Uh, and and I, that is a, I, I think you have to level out your expectations on those things. The capital can't be everything just you know come to me lob, put your name in it pitch anything work with me don't work with me you know work with jake and gino whatever but the capital is the easy part you're getting you're something to work itself out and getting to the other side and and cap capitalizing something in a way that works out for entre for the investors in a way that pays your load in a way that gives you some kind of spiff uh you know at the end of the day is actually harder than it looks it's funny because we bought our first thousand units, just me, Jake, and my partner, Mike. We refied and rolled. We were actually afraid to take money from investors because we didn't. We felt we'd be on the hook. We weren't you know, successful enough. We wanted our proof of concept. And after a thousand units, we said, okay, let's start, let's start raising capital. And for us, it's buy right, manage right, and finance right. That's our three-step proprietary framework. And we self-manage. We're vertically integrated, which people don't understand. And I think that's an important component to it. You know, thinking about that second leg is really, really important. Oh, you know, hey, I got I got something funny here because I, I just took a note. The best deals are the ones where I get my money back. Gino just sold his restaurant like a few weeks before Corona. And I know you probably did a little better than, you know, get your money back. But that that really resonated home, man. He's got out by the skin of his teeth on that thing. So, Oren, this is really important. I want everyone to stop and listen to these next couple of questions because this is how you're going to start creating your pitch. In the book, you talk about the three stages of brain formation. 
This is really important for people to understand the brain formation. You have the neocortex, the mid-level, and the croc brain. Can you discuss those three, those three ty types of the brain and how they affect and how you start creating your pitch through, through those three, uh, brain, three, three sets of the brain? Yeah, and I think I just want to set the context here. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I hired quite a few to unpack what's happening with the mind and the brain <laughs> of the people that I'm pitching to because I felt like when I started going out for capital, I entered bizarro upside down world, mm -hmm. right? Everything that works in sales and marketing backfires in capital raising. Things that work in the normal world create the opposite effect in, uh, in capital try and build relationship, you, no good deed goes unpunished. It's upside down land. And so the things you think you know how to do and that you're good at in regular business go the other way or backfire or go in random directions when you're capital raising. So I really made it my quest to try and understand why things that make sense don't work when you're asking for money. Right. And, and so, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, in well so so I, I tried to understand what was going on with in the m mind of people and um and so i hired a, a cognitive psychologist and it's interesting uh cognitive psychologists don't care about feelings right and so i hired the wrong brain i heard the wrong kind of psychologist right mm -hmm. so i was trying to understand why people were behaving in certain ways based on what i was saying so mr jones is this something you'd be interested in? would you uh do you have any questions about the investment you know do you feel like you, um, this fits your risk profile and you have enough capital overhang to you know, come to the deal and have enough dry powder to continue to invest in the deal, right? Uh, and so when I was saying these things in both tone and body language and content, what psychologically was happening to the investor that they were saying, uh, send me the information, something I need to think about. I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks if I have interest because that's where I was getting hung up. And so I hired a psychologist Send a cognitive psychologist and sat down with me and goes, you know, the thing is, Orn, um, you may have hired the wrong kind of psychologist. I mean, I'm keeping the money. I'm not giving back to you. We, you know, researchers never get money like this. Ten thousand dollars, my God. So, so <laughs> he said, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I don't care about feelings, right? I don't care why people are happy, sad. You know, I only care about how information flows through the mind. Mm -hmm. So let me help you because I think you have a misunderstanding. Information doesn't go from your neocortex the smart, linguistic, scientific, logical, problem-solving, mathematical part of the brain into that same neocortex in the person that you're starting to work with, right? So you start going, uh, it's a great location, multifamily, we're rehabbing the units, it's a 6% you know, ROI, cash on cash in the early years, and it's growing to 18% IRR, and now here is easy to manage, and you think that's <laughs> going like a fax, into uh -huh. their spreadsheet smart brain and they're going, oh my God, a 6% you know, first year ROI. That, that information goes straight. Uh, that's ancient, first part of the brain that, that, that starts to process you and who you are and what you're about. And the croc brain really is going, is this something, I'm hearing words and I'm seeing movement and ideas are coming at me, but I, I'm not, in a mode where I'm, I don't know if this is safe. It's just thinking, huh, I'm hearing all this. Is this something I should eat? Is this something I should fuck? Is this something I should kill? That's all I wanna know. And so the first part of the brain that reacts to you, even if it's a set call, you walk into a meeting, you know, um, uh, and you're just getting a, a, a social interaction started, it's very, ba very basic. Eat, mate, kill. And, and so you sort of have to overcome the, and I know you feel that within you, you meet somebody, you're not going, Hey, the first thing that's coming to your mind is not, Hey, what's the certainty underneath the underwriting and are the air conditioners failing at a, at an increasing rate? You're thinking, what is going on here? Is this safe? Mm -hmm. Right. And that is the crock brain, the, the ancient part of the brain. Seems it's like such a simple place to, to live. You know that just live yeah. in the crock brain, baby. Live in the, <laughs> just, it's just trying to find a way to put this situation in context safe, not safe, right? Um, fight, flight, eat, not eat, time and structure. And so once that part of the brain feels like safe in it, and it can, it can um, lower its vigilance on safety, 
then the information, and by the way, you're just going, yeah, you know, we're really glad to be here. And, uh, you know, we bought 41 multi-unit locations over the last five years and we're one of the leading developer, blah, 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 blah. And, and the, the, the croc brain goes, I'm going to start passing information up to the midbrain. And the midbrain also doesn't care about ROI and IRR and traction and, and prior performance. It cares about status because the, the, the brain can only pay attention to humans when they have peer or higher status than you. The brain really only thinks about somebody in low status position as um, uh, somebody who can do something for them, bring them something, or, or somebody who is not safe. So if you're in the low status position, we've all felt it as salespeople at some point, you're largely disregarded, you're not listened to, the things you say um, don't have, uh, largely don't have meaning, uh, don't create, uh, ha have emotional power, and don't have any power at all. So, so the midbrain needs to understand that you're a peer or a superior in order to give you access to the neocortex. And the neocortex, of course, understands ROI, IRR, and um, uh, pro forma, and traction. And so you have to earn your way to the neocortex. You cannot start there. So you have to get into a swim lane in an on-ramp or whatever terminology you want to use that gets past the croc brain, up through the midbrain, raises your social status to the point where the buyer investor is able and willing and wants to pay attention to you. And then you can start your pitch. Okay. I got to jump in with a question here because I came real quick, you know, so my, before I got into multifamily, I was in pharmaceutical sales. And it was, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say it was like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition, but when I got hired, it was, you know, all these, you know, tall, sure. skinny blondes and they would march them into the doctor's office. And so it was that sort of status thing to break through the croc, or maybe they were thinking with the croc brain, get right. past the mid level because they're interested. And now we can talk about something. Is that fair? Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, pharmaceutical sales is famous for this. Yeah. Um, and, and, so that's exactly right. They, they use the, um, you know, the appearance and the sort of almost status, right. And, and, yeah. and exuberance and fun, you know, to get past a cock brain, proc brain to say, um, Hey, this is safe. This is something <laughs> I can pay attention to. This is something interesting. It's intriguing. It's worth investing time in. Right. Mm -hmm. And then as that pharmaceutical sales rep, can start to develop some um, credibility, right? And it says, okay, hey, I'm not just a lowly sales rep. I control some things that you may want, and I have some control. I have some access. I have some ability to give you something, and then you move up, and that's how those sales are. So absolutely, pharmaceutical sales, guys. So, so some of the things that you want to do with the crock brain is you want to make it interesting. You want to make it different. So for Jake and I, what we like to say is, Jake, what are the three basic human needs? Food, clothing, and apartments, baby. Food, yeah. clothing, and apartments. So right away, that's something a little bit different off the top, right? And then we go into the stock market. Jake, stock market. What's happened to the stock market the last couple of months? Huh? It's destroyed, baby. Getting crashed. Uh, so Crushed. we're not talking about IRR. We're not talking about rates of return. We're trying to make it a little bit different. And, you know, by the way, we with, with the credibility, we've got four weekly podcasts. We've got two best-selling books. We're out there. We've got 1,500 units. So I think students and everyone listening to it start – formulating your pitch that way. You don't have to give them all the information on the first and start, start thinking of different ways to elicit well, responses. Let me answer your question. To get past the crock brain, mm -hmm. what you're talking about needs to be novel, right? Yes. The, the, the brain, the mind of the other person does not want to hear something that they believe they already have seen or know the answer to. We do not have the mental capacity to continue to pay attention to problems that we've already solved. If this looks like a deal that I've seen 100 times, 10 times, five times already, and I think I know exactly what the deal is, uh, then I will not pay attention to it. So it has to be novel. But, you know, in my new book, I wrote about things being too novel, right? So it has to be in a novel sweet spot. spot. Um, it needs to be in a narrative format, not in terms of numbers and ROI, but it needs to be human-based, right? Yeah. So we care about conflict and uh, both love and conflict between humans so, and, and buildings. Ultimately, this is something I learned from my partner. Buildings are only valuable because of the people that go in and out of them. The story of a building is not the story of cement and glass and concrete and stairs and doors and, and faucets and hallways. It is the story of the people who go there in the morning and leave there at night if it's office or, or, or even the opposite. You know, go there at night and leave in the morning if it's residential. 
So, so it's going to be novel. It's going to be in a narrative format. It has to be fast. And it has to be very uh, um, so so fast uh, visual, right? The visual pipes in the human mind are a hundred times faster than the auditory pipes. So any any image that can summarize something fast, novel, um, uh, in, you know, in a narrative format, and that's how you start to get in the structure into the mind of something. That's so you see my presentations, you know, based on all that. Then you start to do status, and people go, okay, well, how do I do status? I mean, I'm a sales guy. I want money. That's a low status position. And that is sort of, I mean, there's so many little things you can do just to establish status. And a lot of those are based on time, for example, you know, time, you, you hear people say, what's the most valuable thing I have? Um, you know, and it's time, time is money. There's all kinds of expressions around that. And, and so um, you're a, you, time scarcity is a very simple, easy way that anybody can establish their own status. So I will say, for example, hey, um, um, very good to meet you. Glad we could find time on the calendar to get together. I don't know if we're lucky or if we're smart, but this time of year we're super busy. Uh, you know, and, and I was glad I was able to put you on the calendar. I've sort of got probably 20, 30 minutes to show you exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, how it works, how we solve this problem, what the ROI is, who we're looking to work with as an investor, and what we might do next. It's you know a lot to accomplish in a very short period of time. Does anybody need fluids in or out? If not, let's get started. And, and so mm -hmm. that triggers a lot of things from the midbrain. This is somebody who has done this many times before. This is somebody who has the most prized executive skill set, which is time management. Oh, there's a clear agenda here in which I would like my own meetings to run on this agenda, right? Uh, I have the ability to pay attention because I know how long this is going to take. This is not going to stretch to an hour or an hour and a half. Uh, and God damn it, I'm going to professionally run meeting. I'm going to get my ass pitched too. And I'm happy to have that happen. Let's roll. Boom. Time posturing. Bring it. Like that. In, in, in a way that's authentic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so some of the young kids can posture, um, you, you know, the, as, as much as pitch anything is on about scarcity and time frames and the crock brain and how these things work. I think it's also important to read uh, Flip the Script my new book, because it gives you scripts in which young people don't get over their skis over, you know, you go in to meet a guy who's been a CFO of real estate um, for, for 20 years or been in, you know, a hundred different projects and you're fairly new to asking for capital, you know, he's going to be able to see through any kind of posturing. So how do you be authentic while still controlling the time frame, while still controlling scarcity, while still doing things in a novel way and still, and if you can do that authentic to yourself, especially again for, for young people, and you can control these frames, well, then you're going to just be, uh, you know, many, many years or eons above where Jake and Gino and myself are. So that's- It's adding value too. You're, yeah. Cause you're adding value to that person's life by setting that structure up on the front end. To me, if someone was pitching me on something, they said that that's value to me because it's predictable. I like that. So Orin, clarity, clarity yeah, is big. In, in the book, you have the three frames, the power, the time, and the analyst. And then you talk about hot and cold cognition. Can you mind diving in that for a couple of minutes? Because yeah. I think it's really important. Well, I think frames is important. If you don't know about frames, this is mm -hmm. something you have to get, understand and get control of. And a frame is the packaging of a perspective mm -hmm. and an ideology and a value system and something you will and won't do. So for example, you know, you go into a, a private investor that invests in multifamily real estate and it, you know, maybe he managed a family office and has got $5 million of dry powder or liquid capital, whatever you want to call it, to invest in deals. He is going through his frame. It is, I have the money, right? You are asking me for money. So you are the, I am the king and you are um, asking me for approval of your idea, of your project, of yourself, of your pro forma, of your location, of your real estate, of your geography, of your plan. And I will proclaim as king, the investor, I'll proclaim my uh, uh, you know, expertise in this area. I will you know, control the time. I will control the flow of information. And I will hold my ability to give you money out as I request for you to do things. And you are the supplicant coming in and asking the king for acceptance and money. 
And that's the frame. His point of view is king, and you are pushed then into the low status supplicant frame. Low status. So these are the frames that are established in our society. In it's the same in SaaS software. It's the same in venture capital. Um, it's in some ways you could argue it's the same in dating and marriage, right? And and so your ability to understand what the frame is, and that's the power frame, right? Mm -hmm. You walk in the guy's five or ten million dollars. You're looking for a million dollars for your unit. You're asking him to invest. He's using the power frame on you. Well, show me what you have. I'll you know I'll take a look at it and consider it. Now, how do you break that frame, right? Well, for me, I said, well, I don't know what you'd be considering. While you are taking time and think you're considering me, I'm evaluating you, right? Because I've already got 90% of the circle. The reason I'm here is because Gino said we should meet. And I said, okay, it's a friend of Gino. And, and um, I, I have an obligation because those guys helped me out. And I came here on request of Gino to show you our asset and tell you, that um, as, a, as a, I've allocated 10% of the deal for new people. But otherwise, we have the thing syndicated. We're just going to go to the guys we normally work with. And so there might have been some confusion here, right, of who's evaluating you. you. And I understand, you know, as much as you want to evaluate a piece of real estate and understand the underwriting, at the same time, I'm spending a huge amount of energy evaluating you. And that would break the power frame anywhere. I can give you a million ways to break the power frame. So the, the power so you frame said that to people. You said I'm evaluating you. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, you <laughs> have to say that. That's that was tough. Yeah, that That's was a pitch, tough. bro. That was it right there. Rewind and just let that play a few times in your head. And I guarantee you're going to get a lot of traction. Because all of a sudden, the guy on the other side is like, wait, he's asking me for money, but he's, he's evaluating me? What's wrong with me? I'm the one with the five million bucks. What's That's what all of a sudden the croc brain is like, what the hell just happened? Now it's going to midbrain because like, okay, now the status thing is going on. Well, you know what? He has 90% of the deal funded already. He's saving 10. I mean, it's, it's genius, honestly. Did you ever get the boot though? You had to get the boot on that a few times, right? No, well, no, think about it. So listen, you have in, in every deal, I will say, listen, I, I like you. You're, you know, you guys are managing a billion dollar fund. You guys have been in um, all these projects. It'd be very exciting to have your logo on the deal. Right. And really I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I really want to do a deal with you. And so you guys are thinking, Hey, that's the opposite of pitch anything. Right. Um, we'll do almost anything to get you guys in, you know, within reason, uh, excited to get your logo on our deck. However, there are some things as I look at your portfolio and the things and the media about you guys that concern me. And I'm worried about a couple of things. So as much as we have a short period of time here together and I have to, you have to evaluate both me and the project and our traction and all the things we've done. I also have to spend some time evaluating you. And if our circles overlap at the end of that, eh, the path forward will be obvious. I gotcha. I gotcha. I like okay? that, Jake. Huh? So <laughs> if you find you, right? So, so you have to run both sides of that. You, so in pitch anything, I say never be needy, right? Because neediness kills the deals. The worst. You can yes. And we'll come back around. However, you might hear me, if you heard a, on a very sophisticated level, half my pitch, it would, you would say, this is the most needy thing that I've ever heard, but I counterbalance it with, I'm not sure I would like you. There's some things I don't understand about you. There's some things that make me nervous. So as much as I'm needy, I counterbalance it with the other side. And there's a lot I have to clear up, right? So, mm -hmm. so you can, that, that has to be in balance. But in general, unless you're very sophisticated and I've shown you how to do this, you do not want to be needy in a deal. And therein comes to your question, the analyst frame. Especially in real estate, what will happen is uh, either the – Power frame will then merge or shift into the analyst frame if it's just one person, or they'll have an analyst there, an actual analyst, a lawyer, an advisor, and that analyst will try and make himself look good by saying, you know, I'm looking at these numbers and, you know, comparing it to the comp, uh, uh, you know, set here, and it looks like the, uh, you know, per square foot is about 10% higher, and your entry cap rate, you know, is really not correlated to other uh, exit cap rates that we've seen in other projections from larger firms, right? And so mm -hmm. in your mind, you're saying, what? I'm sorry, who are you, motherfucker? I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't actually say that. You say, because you're scared and you want to impress the king or the power frame, 
you say, yeah, well, um, you know, we have looked at those other comps and we do feel like we're, we're within the range. We have pushed our numbers a little bit higher, but we think that's complemented by our look. Right. So that's is neediness. When you answer the analyst in analyst terms, uh, you're starting to act needy because he's, and, and, and so you have to break that frame with the expert frame. That's the only frame that really breaks, um, you know, the, the analyst frame is being a more focused expert than, you know, the analyst. Uh, and, and so you don't want to go down these wormholes when somebody is looking at your numbers and sort of starting to throw stones at them. Uh, and the easiest way you can be not needy about it is you go, hey, look, those are great questions. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. We understand this asset and this geography really well. The questions and the diligence you're asking about is probably one or two hours of really going through the numbers and talking about the asset specifically. Happy to do that. But uh, we kind of have 20, 30 minutes here, maybe an hour, right, to really find out about us about the asset, about the basic underwriting, learn a little bit about you guys, see if we even like each other. So some, we haven't even accomplished the basic things here. Happy to get into the details, you know, that are in the three ring binder and the, and the rent roll, uh, but let's get to the basics in this meeting. And if we go further, happy to get into that. And, and yes, we've looked at it and we feel good about it. So here's the thing, politics aside, don't care about politics at all here. Trump kills this. He's sitting there in front of these reporters every day and they're sending, he'll, he'll touch on it. And then like, next question. And they're like, no one even knows it. But when you said that, I remember listening to some of these things, the guy will, will, will give it this much attention. And then he's moving on to the next thing. And it's like, he, he, he crushes that. Here's, here's what he is doing. And if I had to unpack it, you know, a lot of people looking at that wouldn't really fully understand what he's doing. You do not have to answer every question you're That's asked. Right even when you're going into somebody else's office who has 10 or 15 or a hundred or a billion dollars and you're asking for a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars just because that is the situation doesn't mean right there on the spot you have to answer every single question That's and you don't have to point. say i don't know you know the 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 dumb spin selling books that aren't from the real world will say well tell them you don't know and you'll get the answer later don't do that that's low status and needy don't say that shit, right you don't even, sometimes you could just ignore the question. Other times you can, uh, uh, but you don't have to answer every negative question intended to make an analyst look smart and you look dumb. It's your deal. It's not their deal. It's your deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I, that's why I'm circling back to, there is no risk telling someone I am evaluating you because guys, what is worse than having a bad asset? right? Or finding a crack in the foundation or finding the roof needs to be replaced after you've closed. I'll give you a good story of that. Um, but but um, the one thing worse than that is having a bad investor. And so you have the right and you have the obligation and you need to have the value system, which says as much as I need the money, as much as I want the money, right? If you gave me a million dollars right now, I'd hand the check back to you and tear it up. I don't know enough about you to take you as an investor. And when you make that your value system, then all of this becomes easy. And, and so, uh, you know, give me, a, give me a good example. We bought a string of hotels um, and we bought a, a very large Best Western in Arizona and we closed on the deal. Then we went to Best Western and we said, hey, we closed on the deal. Here's our paperwork. Can you transfer us the flag, right? And, they, that, and that's how you get bookings. By the way, if you own, a, a, have you guys done hotels? No, we have not. Oh, it's just like multifamily, except here's what you do. Every morning you wake up and you go, oh, okay, I need 148 leases today. <laughs> and then you wake up tomorrow and you go, oh, what a beautiful day here in Arizona. I need 148 leases today, new ones. That right? sounds like it sucks. That sucks. It sounds like so, it. Well, that's why you need the flag because their booking system, you know, books you a lot of those leases. So they uh -huh. go, yeah, happy to transfer the flag to you um, as soon as you update to our current standard. Right. And the standard is 18 inch flagstone in the lobby, you know, larger uh, dining area, you know, bigger bathroom in the let's all lobby, you know, new signage. So it can cost 700,000 bucks. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're buying a Best Western, 700,000 bucks loaded on top, you know, can can impact your pro forma significantly. So so having a bad partner, having a bad investor um, 
can be uh, more damaging than anything else to your life, your sanity, your stress, your well-being, and the deal. So you have the right to say as much as you're evaluating me, and you should, and you have to, and I understand that I wouldn't respect you unless you did. I have to do the same thing and evaluate you. I love that. Let's uh, let's go to the short answer questions, Jake. You want to take a t- quick time yeah, out? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, quick time out to hear from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Gino and I are super excited to tell you about the audiobook version of The Honeybee, which was recently released. The Honeybee tells the story of Noah, a disappointed, disaffected salesman who feels like his life is going nowhere until the day he has a chance encounter with a man named Tom Barnum, the beekeeper. In his charming, down-home way, Tom, the bee man, teaches Noah and his wife, Emma, how to grow their personal wealth using the lessons he learned from his beekeeping passion. In the audio version, Gino and I sat down for an exclusive interview after each each chapter where we elaborate on the stings we felt throughout the business, the importance of scaling up, and how we've been able to create multiple streams of revenue. For more information and to get your copy of the audiobook, visit jakeandgino.com forward slash honeybee. All right, we are back. So on a personal side note, what is your best habit for success? Uh, t- um, three most important things to do for the day. And they are? Uh, well, I mean, every day is different, right? I mean, like. Oh, just lining out. You, you, these are my top three. Yeah, you got to nail These are my top three it. things that I have to do. I have to get an email out. I have to get a you know, proposal out to a client. And I have to um, uh, you know, perform underwriting on a deal that we're considering. If those things aren't done. Nail those three. The other little things don't matter. See, I'm, it. a, I'm Italian. So I said, eat, sleep, and kiss my kids. Those are the three most important things. That's what came <laughs> to my mind. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, hey, when I get on your, um, you know, kids podcast and, uh, you know, fun things to do with 11-year-olds, then, um, and, you know, how to teach kids hockey, then I have a different list of things. But yeah, so, I mean, oh, oh, we're talking about kids now? Oh, great. Okay. I mean, there is nothing that will pull me away from, you know, my, uh, my little boy. You know, he, I, I have one, you know, I don't have all these kids you have. I have one. So I have to do a good job with him. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta nail that one, Orin. You gotta get that one right. Gino's Gino's like a numbers game, all right? He's like, well, let me let me keep working on this. So, I got that light. I got the what you call it. You know, when you get old, I, I've got one of them that's gonna take care of me. I one out of six. You know, what I mean, I, I've got that elder care, so I got yeah, one out of yeah, six. That's, so, that's, so. Uh, that's good. Uh, so, I mean, for me, you know, it's funny. I have I have a very good friend, Rick Steele, and we have we, you know we're fortunate enough in our careers that we've got our whole lives blended together. So our kids, our career our workouts, they're all part and part. So I don't go to the office for eight hours, come home, work out. Then, the, you know, like, um, I, it, by the way, and where are you guys based? I'm in St. Augustine, Florida. Jake's in Knoxville. Okay, right near here. Yeah, right near here. And I'm in <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. So. You're Knoxville. Yeah, you're close too. Well, I'm in, um, you know, Encinitas, Carlsbad, California. You know, right. So I got a big facility on my finance office. Uh, I have a big warehouse full of cars and motorcycles. It's funny. We had a guy fly in here for financing $30 million guy and he was looking for the bathroom and he walked into the warehouse, right? And, and I have a couple of mechanics back there. Like I've showed, they got tattoos and they're welding and fighting. He's like, oh my God, I walked into another business. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and uh, so, so the next thing over from me is the ocean. Uh, my neighbors are GoPro, uh, SEAL Fit, you know, Navy SEAL training um, and uh, GoDaddy. Um, you know, I got a warehouse full of cars and motorcycles and mechanic working back there. And my, my kid comes during the day. So we have all this stuff integrated into a single lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so if I go higher than the three most important things to do, um, you know, the a higher level, more aesthetic level, you know, the three most important things are something to do, something to look forward to, and someone to love. And if you got that nailed, everything else will come together underneath it. I love that. Nice. What about a, a tip for someone fresh out of college? You know, it's uh, it's like this millennial generation trying to find their way. Any tip for that person coming out of college in terms of you know what they should do with their career? Sorry, did you say millennial? Give up. You're just throw the towel in. I because because even if you start to succeed, Orrin Claff is going to come over and push you down and make you fail because I can't stand millennials. No, um, hey, can you rewind this and erase that? No, yeah. but I, listen, listen. If you're a millennial generation. This is not hard because your contemporaries are doing very little and they're confusing to real people who do real work. Work hard, know a space, come in early, stay late, do your work and understand financial modeling. 
all right? You will be on the cover of Time Magazine as the world's greatest millennial because no other millennials are doing any of that stuff, all right? And I've hired all of them and I can prove it to you. But um, uh, above all of that, the one thing to take away, financial modeling, model, model, model. Okay, nothing can be done, no money can be raised, no business can be started, nothing can be e expressed um, in financial terms, nothing can be pitched until there is a financial model. A pitch, and, and I, you know, I have 50 year olds, 60 year olds who, who, who run large companies who haven't come, you know, want me to help them raise money, who haven't come to realize this. And this is the big takeaway. The pitch is a narrative description of the financial model. If you don't know how to model, you don't know the model, you don't have a pitch. So, so you got the model. Now, you know, you, you have someone that's created a model, they're, they're getting started, and now they have to start pitching people. Um, I heard you earlier, it's basically, it comes down to paying the price. You need to get your reps in. What advice, though, would you, get, you, would you give to somebody who's just starting, maybe they have their first pitch or they're, they're just getting into raising money? It's something I call the unlock code, Okay. Buyers buy how they want to buy. They don't buy how you want to sell. I know that is disappointing mm -hmm. and confusing and unfair and frustrating and limiting and sad, but it is also reality. And reality is that which when you look away, it's still there. <laughs> and so <laughs> an unlock code. Uh, I know this is real estate, but if you go to Sequoia, right, the venture capital firm, they got so sick of people coming and pitching them random ideas in random frameworks, in random order, with random amounts of detail, that they literally put the pitch that they want to receive in a PowerPoint on the front page of their website, right? Mm -hmm. Download this, fill it out, and come pitch it to us. So what they've said is, here's the unlock code for us at Sequoia. This is the information that we need in the order we need it, in the amount of detail that we want. Unlock code, right? And you can unlock their money with it. Now, you cannot take that pitch and then go to Bank of America, right? Because their pitch is, you know, um, what's your passion? What's your vision? What's your mission? What are your objectives? What's your traction? Uh, what's your value proposition? Um, you know, what are your metrics and KPIs? And what is the um, background of your team? And you go to Bank America and give them that pitch and they go, are you guys on drugs? Why are you telling me about mission and vision and you want to change the world? What's your balance sheet, right? So the unlock code is different for different situations. Buyers buy how they want to buy. Now you guys know, if you go to a private equity meeting, you may have seen that you're sitting around, right? And the private equity guys are, they're going to be there for an hour listening to your pitch. And they look bored as, as guard, stone garden gnomes just staring at you. But you say the one thing that they need to know, then take out their little Moleskine notebook, write down that fact, close it back up, because they know it's going to be another 15 minutes before you give them another data point that they actually need to know in order to evaluate what you're doing, right? And they'll open that Moleskine notebook seven times during the one hour and write down the seven things they need to know. And then like a Rubik's Cube, they'll start to, you know, do the work. And so what are they doing? They're putting your pitch together for you. And that's going to limit your chances because they're choosing the narrative. So once you understand what the buyer needs to know, the investor needs to know in the order he needs to know it, then you can build the narrative to fit their brain. And let me bring this home. People go to me, hey, Orrin, what do you do when an investor interrupts you? I don't fucking know. No investor interrupts me. Not because I talk loud or I talk fast or I'm forceful. Or I have a force of personality or I have charisma because I give them the information they need as they're going, I'm wondering about, and then boom, I'm delivering it in a sufficient amount of detail for that specific meeting. And they just relax and go, I'm at a professional meeting. I'm getting all the information I need. No, none of the key critical questions are left unanswered. And I am being satiated with a pitch that is how I wish our people could pitch our partners. This is fantastic. Keep going. And I give you a, a sense of that. You know, I've given a pitch to, um, to a committee and um, the, 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 sorry guys, I'm talking over you. I know you have a lot of questions and these are supposed to be short, but uh, I'll, I'll just, you're good, man. One last point. So, so I give this pitch, it's about 25 minutes long and um, the five or six guys are in there and the committee start, they're like <laughs> applauding. Right. 
and the head, the, um, the chairman of the board goes, stop, oh, stop. We don't applaud people coming here to ask us for money. Like we Easy ask enemy. them tough questions and we <laughs> yell at them and we tell them to get out of here. Like, and they go, no, but it was so good. Like, hey, can we get Tom and Harry over? Hey, Warren, could you do that again? Right, if we bring Tom and Harry in here, right? That's where you wanna be is people go, I wanna see that again. Not how soon can you leave here? You have mm-hmm. to be good at it. Yeah, it should be, it should be infotainment. I love that. Uh, any book recommendations? Oh man. Um, so I think one thing that'll be really healthy for people to read and is, is boring. Uh, well, sapiens, you know, unless you believe in God, then don't read sapiens. You know, that could screw up your understanding of the relationship of where man came from and, and why we exist. But sapiens is, is really good. I think it, it gives you a real functional view of reality. And then just a super boring one, competitive advantage by Michael Porter. Everybody who goes to Harvard business school, has to read it um you it it the, the the fundamentals haven't changed today on competitiveness so competitive advantage by michael porter and sapiens by whatever the guy that wrote it you like sales Warren? do you enjoy it so it's funny i i love figuring out how to close a deal and so and i get hired by a lot of sales firms, you know, that, that do sales, but I don't view myself as a salesman. I view myself as a deal maker, but I love making a deal. And I love it most when the buyer goes, so how do we get started? And I never have to say, so what do you think? Is this, you know, um, are, are you ready to get started? Can we go ahead? Will you sign the contract? I never have to close. It's always them going, can we start on Monday? And that is amazing because you have added so much value. You've created something so interesting and intriguing that the buyer wants to do business with you. And why is that important? Why does the investor need to want to work with you? Because that makes a robust deal that won't fall apart as issues start coming up. They have to want it. If you're pushing it on them and they only want it intellectually because of the ROI, it has a really high risk of falling apart. When people want you, trust you, are certain about the future that you're telling them is going to happen. That is robust and has a very high likelihood of getting done. Nice. What project are you excited about right now? Oh my gosh. Uh, so, I mean, truthfully, I, I have three or four COVID-19 firms that mm. have real pro, um, um assessment projects. So I'm raising capital for them, you know, another capital raise. So anything that can help get all of us on the other side of this mess, um, you know, whether it's real or not, and it's the same as the flu or bigger than the flu or worse than the flu, or, you know, not as bad as a car accident. I don't know, but it, it, it feels like if I can help finance some COVID solutions, I'm excited about that and, and putting time and energy into it. You, you're taking your superpower and, and applying it for good. Amen to yeah. that. Uh, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Man, it's, if, you're, if you've got a project that's got some scale and it's real, you could just email me. And I mean, I won't answer it, but you can email anyway. No, my team will pick it up. Oren at Pitch Anything. But I, I just recommend uh, go to pitchanything.com and put your name in. And we'll get you good information, stuff you can use, uh, and, and get you spun up on the things we talked about here today. And ultimately, if I can get in your mind these three things, people want what they can't have, people chase that which moves away from them, and people only value that which they pay for, then people will want your stuff. And so put your name in it, pitch anything, and I'll help try and make that part of your reality. That is awesome. Gina, let's see the book again. You got the book there? Dude, I mean – long podcast but i mean we could go for another three hours i, I seriously we just scratched the surface of the book jake i got like fifteen yeah, thousand questions the, i over thought here. you had more questions i'm like I, he's hitting me with the I, short answer already i'm like are we just did we just get started here Come well, on, dude i'm telling you we could go forever that's why everyone's got to go pick up the book i gotta read flip the script so um my my way i, I learn what i'll do is i'll read the book then i'll get on audible then i'll take notes and i'll transcribe the notes you need to listen to the book and read and you need to listen to the podcast and obviously take notes because the gems he's throwing down i mean Holy crap. This is 
How you start raising capital? You got to enjoy what you're doing. And obviously, Oren loves what he's doing. He loves the deal, but he understands the brain. And that's the important thing. And he, and he doesn't think of him as a salesperson. That's what, that's what everyone thinks. So you're not being a salesperson. You're offering an opportunity to somebody. Let's make it fun out there. So um, I wish we could go on a lot longer. I could go on all afternoon, Mr. Senziano. So this, no, it's, 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 it's to his point. Awesome. It's entertaining and it's fun and there's a shit ton of value. So Oren, appreciate it, man. And, uh, and crush it with, with your COVID stuff. Really appreciate hey, it. Hey, thank Thanks, you very Oren. much. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.